Do you want to know how work will be done in the future? The majority of what you're doing today will be done for you by these things called AI agents. That is the topic of this show today. We are going to get into some of the best examples of AI agents, what large companies are releasing over the coming months, what is an AI agent and how it is going to impact marketers and B2B software in general. I'm Kieran Flanagan, CMO over at Zapier. Now, Kip is living his best life. He has been in Tokyo. He is now in Singapore. So I have brought in Nicholas Holland. He's back on the show, product leader of our HubSpot, leader of their marketing hub business to talk all about AI. Let's get into today's show. Welcome everyone to another episode of Marketing Against the Green. We're back with Nicholas Holland, product leader over at HubSpot, the leader for the Marketing Hub, business leader for the Marketing Hub. And we are going to do a show all about the future of work and AI agents. If you really care about how work gets done in the future, how AI is going to be transformative for how all of us do work and what that means for you, you want to stay tuned for this episode. Nicholas, welcome back to two shows in three weeks. Yeah, it feels like there's a lot going on. Obviously, we have a lot to talk about. This is going to be a fun show for you and I, and hopefully people enjoy it because this is the stuff we like to nerd out on. We spent 15 minutes nerding out on other things before we got started here. But what we want to do for the listeners, right there, we want to kind of talk about AI agents. We're going to get into some of the big announcements that OpenAI made. Some of the other companies have made around AI agents. So there's a lot of like press and a lot of uh, discussions around AI agents and how they're going to transform work. But I don't really know if we know what AI agents are, right? I don't even know if we know uh, there's like one meaning for that term. And you and I kind of just started talking about this off mic. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you think about AI agents? Because you're doing a bunch of this work in HubSpot. And then I can get into some of the examples and the way I could explain it to listeners. Sure. So the Wikipedia definition of an agent is is basically like an autonomous entity that's kind of performing some sort of task in the background. And boy, there's a lot of interpretation whenever you say that. And the irony is, is that before anyone goes and reads that Wikipedia article, a lot of times they're thinking of like, you know, Ultron, the robot in Avengers. Right. <laughs> but then Wikipedia quickly moves to giving an example that a thermostat is an agent, which is kind of a wonk, wonk moment when most people are uh, talking to me. Not as sexy as yeah, the exactly. Avengers example. <laughs> so <clears throat> we, a couple of things are happening that I think uh, would help the listeners and it kind of helped me. We're at this kind of interesting next S curve of, of AI AI effectively is building lots of foundational stuff, whether it's LLMs, these large language models or these large action models. It's building these kind of technological entities that allow a computer or a technical entity to do stuff. And in the past, if you think about it, we had a computer and we said, if user does this, do this. And that was very much that the developer would give a whole bunch of parameters, heuristics, we call it, like rules. And then the system would do that. So HubSpot today, think about it. Most of HubSpot is uh, you click on this nav item and then it refreshes this screen, right? Pretty straightforward. So what happens in a world where the programmer doesn't give it specific input output rules? It gives it basically a goal. You know, if you think about the thermostat, I know this is silly, but I'll just start there. The thermostat, the goal is to keep it at 72. Or if you're in my house with my wife at 69, which is like freezing all the time. <laughs> but if that's the goal, then the thermostat does that. And it takes all sorts of inputs. It takes the temperature and the humidity and the time of the day. And are you on ego? And it works through all that, but it tries to keep it at that temperature. The ability now, because of what's happened with OpenAI leading the way in the LLMs, is that now you can start to move that well beyond just something simple like keep it at 72 degrees. And so we've started to think here at HubSpot like, oh, man, so really what this is is like a fidelity issue. The problem, keep it at 72 degrees, pretty discreet. What if the problem was something like make the house comfortable? Mm, now it's a lot more uh, subjective. What does comfortable mean? There has to be a lot of intuition behind that. Uh, and then you move on and on. And so at HubSpot, what we've started to do is first try to figure out what are the problems that we're trying to solve. And so take it in my world. Uh, I use one very straightforward is like social media. Like I am trying to be on brand. I'm trying to publish some posts. I'm trying to react to people appropriately. I'm trying to listen and monitor. And then I'm trying to also tell the powers that be how we're doing. So it's like five discrete kind of problems that are wrapped up in this social media role. And so we've started asking ourselves like, could 
AI start to do that? And there's all sorts of debates as to what does autonomous mean. And so if any of you listeners are like having this like deep debate in your organization, we we get wrapped around the axle at HubSpot because people really want this thing to be autonomous. And then on the flip side, we're trying to use some sort of practical knowledge and be like, well, you don't want it to turn into Skynet. So at some point it has to check in with a human and be like, do these social posts look good? And uh, and so that there's a lot of interpretation under all of this, but I'll pause there because I think that really with agents now, the concept is how do you combine a bunch of fundamental capabilities with the right fidelity of problem and it's goal oriented. So you're trying to say, hey, we're trying to get this done. And when you do that, it begins to look a lot. I know it sounds weird. It begins to look a lot like a human in terms of the role that's performing. And so I'll, I'll pause there. That's kind of how we're thinking about it. Yeah. So you can like give it a goal, give it some, you know, you fine tune it towards that goal and it can complete that goal autonomously. I guess some examples might be training an AI agent on all of your internal customer support documentation, your policies, your internal training, and then have it give it the goal to like get back to every single customer support ticket within a certain, well, it should be kind of instantaneously because there's no, <laughs> like there's no resource constraints uh, with AI agents, which is the scary thing for humans. But he, wait, like, I guess wait, like, wait. yeah. Hey. This is funny. Or, or, okay, there is resource constraints maybe with GPUs. Well, I was going to say, this is funny. Um, to take it down the path, we were debating on, and this gets really nerdy really quick, but like we were taking down the path of like OpenAI, they call their custom GPTs agents. Right. And right. if you think about it, what they're simply saying is, is that it wasn't programmed by anybody. It was given like a goal in the background. Like, I want you to recite everything in poetry in the in the voice of Gordon Ramsay. Like, that's like a goal. It's kind of a weird goal, but like that's enough for it to do that. So a question for you, Kieran, is uh, right now when I go ask chat GPT to write me a blog post, is that an agent in your mind? I don't think that's an agent because it hasn't been fine. I think of agents as specialists. Like you actually use that word off mic and that's how I. Can you and I roll back the clock 10 years from now? Is it reasonable to go hire an agency to blog for you? 10 years ago? Yeah. Yeah. So why is it not applicable now? But I think your example was chat GBT right in the blog post, but chat, chat GBT is like an AI interface that does broad based set of tasks. Whereas I think of an AI agent as something that has been trained. Let's like, that one of the ones that I've seen time and time again is like in the medical sector where you have an agent trained on propriety data and then you can give it some sort of autonomous goal because it's been trained on that data and it's specialized to do that task. And so when you when you have these kind of large language models like chat GPT, they haven't been like, they're pre-trained, but they're not fine-tuned, right? Like they're pre-trained, pre-trained on the majority of the data on the internet, but they're not fine-tuned to complete any one specific task. Like they'll complete whatever task they can do do based upon that data. And I could be wrong on this, but then like an AI agent to me is like something has been like really fine tuned to be auton- to the point where it can autonomously complete a task based upon that data. Two ideas are going to smash into each other. If you think about it, you're basically saying uh, it's not an agent because it's too general. Right. But what happens when we hit AGI? Yeah, I think all when that- kind I, of I, artificial I, general intelligence where something can learn on its own. I mean, think about it. Yeah. Me as a human, I'm not just a product leader. I'm not just a writer. I'm not just a speaker. I am this kind of AGI into, you know, entity that has multiple skill sets. So can you imagine if someone said, nah, you're not really a human because you're not very like, you know, until you're in this particular specific role. And I think this is where people start to get kind of wrapped around the axle, which is, I do think personally in my particular stance, that when you go to chat GPT and you're like, write me a blog, I do think that is an agent. Now, I think we're mm. well past that, which kind of blows people's minds. And I think that doesn't capture the the essence of what we're really trying to talk about today, to your point. But I think if I say, hey, I'm writing for you know uh, a particular entity or a particular outlet, and this is my audience, and this is the topic, and I need you to help me write something, that is goal-oriented. It autonomously does it. It has the ability to, if you think about it, to talk back and forth, just like you hired somebody 10 years ago and said, well, I don't like this. doesn't fit my tone. The problem is that we've just blasted past blogging as a use case so fast that now we're moving into stuff like, like you were saying, like the medical archival or the lawyer ones. But this was the debate that I had a while back, and I'll, I'll leave it here, is that right now, let's assume that effectively this chat GPT agent, this next version five or whatever, 
let's assume that now they can instantly go grab data, vector embeddings, or kind of like stores of data elsewhere. If you had a brilliant genius chat GPT that could go grab all of the, you know, medical data somewhere, wh where does the agent begin and the data? Yeah, yeah. Like, so that's, well, that's, that's, that's where it is. It, 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 it's basically when does it, like it continues to not automate, but it continues to remove the human requirement from the loop, right? Like the, yeah. the reason, I actually I can see why OpenAI described custom GBTs as agents because you give them a goal and then you give them some yes. sort of upload to fine tune them towards that goal. Absolutely. And, but over time, your point is that that is like a human having to like give you the goal and having That's to right. like give you some or, additional or, data to fine tune you. What I would say is more simply, the fidelity is too low. Right. At the end of the day, the fidelity is too low. And so even in HubSpot, for example, we've got these things called assist assists. Like you write an article, you can highlight it and have it rewrite it. It comes up with ideas, for example, on what you should write. It will basically draft outlines. Like it's all of these different individual tasks. But we have started to move down the path of where it would say like, do my, you know, like at the end of the day, put together a content publishing schedule for me. So like now if you think about it, if it puts together five or six posts that are on brand, that are basically tied to some relevant moment in time or something with your company, it then effectively submits those for approval from a human. The human looks at it, says, this is good. It then publishes those. Is that an agent or not? To us, we think that yeah, totally yeah. I Yeah, I, I think the agent thing is confusing. Like one of the ways that um, I've been thinking through it or thinking about it I've just been going by like how people like OpenAI describe it. So they they did their agent launch. I'm sure you've seen that. There's like two two agents. They clearly describe two agents. One is going to learn how you use software and replicate how you use that software. And I've a, I I have an example of that in action, not from OpenAI, but I want to show you. Someone tweeted about it today. And then the other one is like this task based engine. And we're going to get into a little bit on Rabbit R1 because that is like a task based engine, which is they they want so they want to be able to have you use any software through natural natural language and there was a company i'm sure you know them adept that were really first to like move in that direction and open ai look like they want to move in that direction and then the second one is there are there are a lot of search that we do which is just search that we just want to query to the answer but there's a lot of search that we do has an action past the search that we have to do ourselves and open ai right. i think want to both build the web tool because they're relying on Bing today to do the search and they've said they want to build their own web tool and then complete the action. And that is like two and two giant markets. It, it is. Think. Watch this. Just playing ping pong with you for a minute. Um, do you know who Stephen Hawking is? Yep. He was a brilliant scientist, had a degenerative um, health issue that, that effectively locked him into a wheelchair for the rest of his life. What did he have at his disposal? He had thought and he had language. He had no action. It doesn't make him any less of a human or a powerful entity. It just means that there's a body of things in the human world that he couldn't do. That's kind of how I think about where we are now on the agent standpoint, which is you've got this, you know, these large language models that are effectively this kind of bucket of, of intelligence or knowledge, whatever you want to call it, married with the only action they can do is language. Right. And to your point, you can give it more knowledge and you can kind of tell it to be more specific and you can give it some knowledge instructions. Don't do this. Do do this. But if the medium basically leaves the knowledge part or leaves the language part, that whole world is unavailable to them. And so to your point, what I think is interesting is that those are Stephen Hawking is a scientist and a human, but he's a lot different than somebody who can go physically manifest that into the world. And I think that's where the action models are coming in. So I see that all as part of this agent aspect to your point. And I just go back to, I think of it as a set of like capabilities. We're going to keep giving them capabilities. We're going to be able to keep giving them higher and higher fidelity of goals. And then of course they will be able to put all that together and start doing it. But I, I just wanted to start there because I think when you are dealing with chat GPT or a custom GPT. That is an agent. It's just a very low fidelity, not a lot of capabilities versus where we're going. Right. As someone who builds business software, what are your thoughts like on the, because I've 
racked my brain around this. Like, what are your thoughts on, let's say, OpenAI, Adept, these kind of companies do win, and the majority of people can use their software through a natural language interface layer and don't really have to go into the product. Like, the best example actually is like one of the ones that are very applicable to HubSpot, which is the number one reason a CRM fails in any single company is because the sales reps do not want to go into the app and use it, right? They want to use the tools and then magically in- have the data ingested and they want to have the data come back at them, but they never want to really log into the app itself. And HubSpot has been successful in that space because they've made it rep friendly. Like I was part of the team that launched that. And like the thing that that team really wanted to do was build it for the reps and make sure the reps liked using it. But if you could give sales reps a natural language tool and have it, you know, used through email or something else. And so it uses the CRM in a way where they never have to go in and physically use that tool. They would probably do it. But yeah. it puts it puts software in a weird place because then weird. who cares what the back end is? Who weird cares place. Yeah, we, um, I think there's like a, a bunch of emotions that go through when I think through this. I think the first is the first time somebody invented HTML and CSS and a little bit of JavaScript, they had no idea where we would end up with today's technologies. So I think that, you know, using the past to inform the future, we have no idea where we're going to end up. I think the second thing is, is that, uh, as you know, Kieran, I like a lot of philosophy. And so one of my (laughs) philosophical phrases is around anxiety. And I like uh, one of the stoic phrases, which is like, why suffer twice? You know, at the end of the day, if you're going to suffer, just suffer at the moment that it happens. Why basically worry about it? So I basically continue to encourage my customers, the people in my sphere, our our employees, like why suffer twice? And what I mean by that is, is we don't know where it's going to end up. Have a good time along the way and just continue to try to basically stay in, you know, stay, stay focused on solving for the customer, do good work. What I think is fascinating about all of this is that I do think this is a move the cheese moment. I don't know if anybody's read that book. It's kind of an American based book, but like there's a a concept that effectively every day this rat goes in a maze, sees where its cheese is. And one day that cheese is moved and this rat cannot, cannot fathom (laughs) that the cheese has been moved. And so it basically dies in that spot waiting for the cheese. And this is a moment where the cheese has been moved. And if you don't move, you will die. I do believe that. Right. Right. Now, how much you move, how far you move, that, that's the game here that a lot of people are playing. There'll be startups that are like so far ahead of everybody that they'll fail miserably because the world's not ready. I mean, you got to think about it. Right now, I laugh. We were just uh, at our, uh, at, I was up in Boston this last week. And I'm asking some of the world's best marketers. You know, get to remember HubSpot is incredible, like not just the software, but like the marketers at HubSpot are the best. And I'm like, what AI tools are you using? And we have a corporate version of chat GPT and three of the six goes, I love our corporate version of chat GPT. Think about that. They're still just using chat GPT as their main thing. Some had moved on to using a little bit of search, but like we're very early. And so I think that, there's a lot of innovation happening, but we also have to make sure we meet people where they are. They have to be ready for it. You've got someone like my wife that is like an absolute like rejector of technology. You've got people who are basically feeling a little bit, you know, skeptical of it. You know, talk to somebody about agents and then make the mistake of equating that to Alexa. And you will quickly <laughs> see all of the emotion and excitement yeah. drain out of them because you can barely get Alexa to play the right song for you half the time. Not. So I just bring all that up because I think that we are at the precipice of a big change. But to your point, I'm not too worried about it because right now I don't think anybody knows what's up. I think we're watching all sorts of really cool things happen, uh, but we don't know exactly what's going to catch the zeitgeist. Yeah, I think it is interesting on the, on the user level. I think a lot of AI apps have really struggled to get any type of usage and retention. I think ChatGPT has kind of swept the market in terms of being like, for the for the person who's not really in it day to day, ChatGPT is AI, right? You don't really need to go beyond that. Most of the money being made is actually in the the back end, the the fine tuning of models, the LLMs, the pre training, all of that kind of stuff is where a lot of the mon- investment and money is being made. But I think the big thing is. 
what you kind of alluded to there is we don't know what the user interface is when you don't have to click on apps, right? That is the big thing. I think the one of the launches that came out recently, I know Kip obviously bought one of these because he buys all the new gadgets. <laughs> we were watching happen and I was like, I'm going to buy one, but then I didn't end up buying one because I'm always like, it can never, I'm just so indecisive with these things, but the Rabbit R1, I'm actually, I'm going to get one because I read about it again today. So the Rabbit R1, and I, for people who aren't um, aware, it's this device and it's like a little orange box. I think they've cleverly made it like a Tamagotchi. Do you remember the Tamagotchis where the little pets oh, yeah. and the key ring? It's like a, it, it's like a Tamagotchi esque because it has a little rabbit as the, uh, as the person, the kind of personality. But basically, really, what it is is, is a, it's a large action model. I and mean, the large action model means, in basic terms, it learns how people use websites and apps and mimics those actions for a voice prompt. So over time, the more you use your rabbit, the more it can actually complete these tasks on your behalf. And what's interesting about that is there is no apps to click. It is all done through voice. And you kind of pull that forward and you're and you know, this is the open AI. Are they going to work with Johnny Ives and then you phone? What does a large language model operating system look like if you actually have that run in your laptop versus something that is like app based? That's the like that that to me is the biggest unknown for all of us working in the click, 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 moot drag things around B2B software is I don't know if any of that makes the cut in the next kind of user interface. I think it will. I mean, I'm an Android user, uh, much to the chagrin of my peers. And I tell them after many years, uh, I originally stuck with Android because I think Apple is not my favorite company just on some of their practices. But then I have subsequently stuck with Android, honestly, because of voice. Right. It's unassailable. Like the... And I talk to my phone all the time. I, every text message, every email, every, you know, call my wife, all of that stuff is, is talk, talk, talk. And they've done a great job of that. On the flip side, they just brought Gemini to the phone for the first time. And where some of this gets funny and you know, it's going to get fixed, but like, I will ask, you know, I can say H G, you know, it's, Hey, G O O. I'm not going to say it now. My phone's here, but I can say that. And it's extremely responsive. It, it answers stuff. Gemini is awesome. It's like having kind of like a chat GPT with perplexity, like, you know, in the, in the phone. But the funny part is, is to, to your point about the action model is I will ask it to call my wife and it still can't do that. So it literally <laughs> got rid of Google. It got rid of Google Assistant <laughs> and it can't even call my wife. And so we've got to figure this stuff out. I think um, to your point, some things that have been interesting on the agent side, I'll give you some, some real uh, brain busters that I've been thinking about. First, we've got a user adoption and it's got to be this, uh, it's got to be an iterative loop. You just talked about, you have to train the rabbit to do stuff. So effectively these models have to work for the person. And these people are now trying to pull off personalized models, which we've never pulled that off in almost anything we do. Nothing is really that personalized across our whole life right now. So they're going for a very, very big challenge. That's number one. Number two, what I think is fascinating is you're asking humans to be part of this experiment. And there will always be early adopters. But do you envision your grandmother doing a rabbit and saying, order me an Uber? Maybe not. So now we've got just time scale will matter over the next decades, you know, so we've got that. The third thing that I think is fascinating is there's just so much to be done that I don't know if it's going to be a very general model. So like a open AI, uh, like a rabbit, or what I actually am starting to think will happen is I think there's two things, efficiency and effectiveness are just the two kind of big levers that I think about with AI. So I think to myself, what can we do to make people more efficient? What can we do to make them more effective? And on the agent side, I think that's why we've seen such a blossoming of the co-pilot. Because if you think about an adoption model, I need to work with the human to get better. I basically now to work with the human, I have to present my way myself in a way that's not threatening to them. That is, I am a collaborative entity. I'm a co-pilot with you. And we both now have a common goal. I'm this co-pilot entity. I don't get paid. I don't have a salary. So my common goal is to help you human. And your goal is to basically do work for the company to get paid. So all of the incentives are aligned at this moment. And now the co-pilot's job, and I don't think a lot of companies get this, the co-pilot's job is not to replace the human. It's to basically make the human 
more valuable. So in this next phase, and I'm not saying at some point there there might not be humans that are replaced. I mean, you got to look at the Luddites in the past with that, with the, the printing press and you don't have stenographers anymore. So there will be some roles that catch the short end of the stick. But in general, what I think is awesome is just take a today's marketer, take their computer away and be like, do your job. They can't. They would be completely right. worthless because all of the technology brought to bear today gives them a certain level of capability and productivity. That's where I think this stuff is about to go with the co-pilots and the agents, for example. And I'm pretty excited because I'm, I'm about to give a talk here in Nashville and I was talking about some of this stuff and the guy goes, should I be scared? And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, I, I do social media myself. Like, am I about to be out of a job? And I was like, if you suck at social media, yeah, you might be out of a job. <laughs> On the flip side, at the end of the day, imagine if you had basically a college educated kind of intern that came to work for you. Could you put them to work in such a way that it actually helps you with your goal, your boss, your company? Of course, you could help. They could do better research. They might have better time for you to basically do the menial tasks that unlock your creativity or strategic thinking. And so that's where I think next is coming with the agents. I think they'll do a lot of menial tasks. Rewriting a blog post, for example, is kind of a menial task nowadays. So I think they'll do menial tasks. And I think what's exciting about most of us is that that will allow us now to move higher up the value curve is what I really believe is going to happen. Last crazy concept is what happens when you buy software to your point today, you negotiate as hard as you can. Oh, I want HubSpot to give me a discount and I want it to be cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. And then you basically bang on all your employees. I bought this expensive software here and you better use this. Those are your two motions. What happens for the first time whenever you buy HubSpot and you get extra capacity? For the very first time you buy HubSpot and you have agents that you can now hire that do something like your, it's like a whole content marketing department in a box. It's like a whole social media department right. in a box. That is really going to change, I think, how people buy software and think about stuff. And I don't know where that's going to shake out, but I think that's going to be the interesting next step. Co-pilots yeah. and agents, and we, that's how I think it's going to touch business. Yeah, I think everyone gets a, a co-pilot and will have to learn how to outsource parts they have to divide up tasks like all jobs are just the totally. array of tasks and you'll have to like figure out the tasks that you can give to the co-pilots so you can actually get better at the other ones the one that you touched on i actually have thought a lot about which is just the purchase of software because all marketing is really the entire uh the entirety of b2b marketing is just trying to nudge you towards buying a, a piece of software like that, that they we like to think of it as more than that, but that's really what it is, right? That's and right. So if you actually think about that, I was actually still stepped back y yesterday and I was thinking about just that process. No no one, I don't know if you've ever met someone whose job it is to buy software enjoys buying software in the first place, right? Then it's not, you don't wake up in the morning and go, oh, I'd love to get really great at buying software. It's just part of your job. And I, I think that it, is an unnecessary task when you actually have an agent because what an agent can actually do is they can take a goal to your point like here are the exact requirements in terms of what my company needs it can scour the web and then build you a scorecard right it can actually summarize your website it can sign up for the company's websites and instead of you getting drip 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 website you can actually have that agent receive that website through an inbox and actually summarize those things for you it can take a demo of the product right because you can just give it some guidelines and if you look at where we're going with open ai in the depth you can have things that sign into software and complete tasks and it can scorecard the tasks to say whether it was able to do those things or not similar within the free trial and what i was thinking through was like Okay, well, in the future, if a company can have an agent just build a scorecard of software and like where where that software landed in terms of their requirements and the agent did the majority of that and then the human makes a final decision based on those scorecards, like the other thing the agent can do is aggregate user reviews and based upon the exact things you care about, summarize like where the user reviews landed, positive, negative, whatever it may be. Well, it, would, it actually, you don't, you're not marketing to humans anymore because now your entire B2B sale has been reduced just to a scorecard. But and actually, it's, it's, that, that doesn't bother me. This is like when people tell me they're like, uh, oh, I'm so scared. Uh, this is going to just produce an enormous amount of terrible content. And I'm like, that's a solved problem. That's a solved problem. I don't think it's going to, I don't think, I'm, I'm not scared of that. I'm, no, but I'm, I'm saying, saying like what you just described, you just described like G2 crowd. It's a solved problem. Like I go there and I look at the reviews and I just, and so all that's going to happen is like, 
energy is going to ebb and flow to different places. There's going to be, you know, either G2 crowd is going to lock it down and not let people scrape it because they want the humans to come there or reverse. What's going to happen is everybody's going to get really good at their Capterra and G2 crowd and their stuff like that. And but so you, but I, I'm saying that you, Nicholas, have to buy a let's get like a, a, a calendarly like tool right in your company. You and you just have an agent. Give it a set of requirements, and it comes back to you individually. It's not like on a, it's not on the aggregator totally. side. The thing that I'm actually more thinking through is not that it creates a bunch of content, but all of these marketing tricks that we use to nudge right, right. people a, towards the purchase don't matter anymore because it's no, 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 no. That's that's what I'm saying. Is I think that's a solved problem. Okay. In that well, how does that at the problem? end of the day? Here's what I'm saying: is like I think that you're right. This will be a new motion. So make no mistake. But what I'm saying is, is wherever that perplexity goes out or the Gemini goes out, there's like, it's like what marketers do. Like we will have to adjust. It will get its data from someplace. Right. And then we will begin to figure out how to get our data into that place. And the battle will no longer be for the first page of the search engine. It might be for some of these destination type sites like Capterra or G2 Crowd. Like that's all they do nowadays. But even your emails, right? Like, like today, today, a lot of demand gen, when you capture the lead, you create like really great copy and you try to segment your users into different parts. Like they are in these different parts of the journey and I map the copy and the value. Totally. Uh, what I'm saying is that that is not going to be that impactful when it's not a human receiving that. It's an agent just Well, that's, that's a new one. If, I don't know that that's happened it's yet, happened but yeah, you're yet, right. If, but. If, if you get to a point where something can connect the dots and do an instantiated search, followed by it knows how to sign up, followed by it knows how to then summarize, yeah, yeah. then we've got a new game that we've got to figure and out. That is happening. Let me just show you this uh, because this was pretty uh, pretty timely um, because it actually is related to this. Someone was posting about the end agent that they created. So I, I, I caught this on Twitter earlier on. I thought it was really interesting because it's like how quickly we can train something to complete tasks on our behalf, which is somewhat like an agent where, you know, this person are, was looking for an apartment on Zillow and Gemini was able to code and replicate that task and describe everything they did step by step. And so the, the code opens a Chrome browser, navigates to Zillow, enters, you know, the area they want to look in for rent enters a price range, bedrooms, and then apl applies to applies to condos that are in within their, um, you know, wheelhouse, the thing that they want to do. Now, this is a very simplistic thing. This to me will become how quickly it is to outsource, like what we've talked about, outsource a bunch of tasks, because where I see this working is to your point, like, yeah, uh, you don't want to you don't want to put a ton of friction on the user. So this just sits in the background, which is why I actually think OpenAI need a browser. Like if you actually look at where they're going, they oh, yeah. actually need a browser to actually totally. be able to see users do these things across the web. Totally. But this is a really good example of like Gemini doing this. Like Gemini was able to kind of just replicate this task for that person. But look, this is why I said it's a solved problem. And maybe I'm, I'm you know, too nostalgic for the past, but like uh, you had search engine optimization come out because of this big trend and it kicked off a whole new industry to me, when I say it's a solved problem, it's like somebody will switch out to do something like Gemini optimization expert. Right. There will be something, there will be a degree out there where marketers, was that, was that Jurassic Park phrase? Like life will find a way. Marketers <laughs> will find a way. <laughs> like at the end of the day, like, always, we will find a way to saturate whatever you That's right. Comes. You know, make no mistake. And so <laughs> I do think that, you know, marketers have to be aware of this changing, the speed yeah. of which it's changing, the degree we have to be very flexible. The cheese will be moved This that, as to when. I don't know if it's going to be as fast as some people think. So take like what you said right there. There's no net new value. It's just a neat science project. There's no net right. new value there because it's using all the structured data that you could have, you know, theoretically just gone to Zillow and searched. So what it did is that's almost like a poor person's API, what you just described right. for exactly. me. Which is like, exactly. And I think that's cool. So I think ultimately... The next phase for me, I think, will be to your point. How do you take some of these new capabilities and apply them towards kind of what we're kind of calling like a specialist type role? I think there'll be a specialist role will be like a, a role that you might hire in a company. There's like different fidelities. I think there's a co-pilot model, which will be so like the specialist would be doing work in a particular genre. The co-pilot will be probably helping you do your work. So uh, now where this gets really wild, I don't know if you want to get this is like, we're not at the point yet. And this is the next paradigm I expect to happen is like, what happens when a co-pilot agent can go hire a specialist 
So now <laughs> what happens when agents Can call on other agent. agents? Yeah. That's what I think is going to come next. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. They, I, I like there. There was I can't. We covered auto. Was it auto GPT that was kind autonomously? This is way. Was, it's well. I was going to say way back when. It's literally like a year ago. Uh, like that's how far we've moved. Or how quickly we've moved. But it was. Like, it can autonomously call on other GPTs to com- complete tasks. Well, we're which makes we're thinking of that now because this is why I go back to the agent definition. Um, if you don't think that like the blog agent is an agent, um, this might be tough to get to. But if you begin to think of like an agent is you just give it a goal and it does an autonomous thing. Well, then you begin to like open your mind a bit to the point where you're like, uh, I need an image that matches the underlying source material. I'm going to generate an image. Pretty straightforward. Think about it. Like I'm a, I'm on Dolly. I'm like, I'm going to post some text. Can you pick the right image for it? That is effectively, you post text, it does a summarization model, it then creates a prompt and then posts it to Dolly. If you're spending much time in AI, that's like the simplest of all things that are happening right now. But in my mind, you could roll back the clock a few years and that used to be a photographer. That used to be basically a stock image selector, used to be what you would call a design layout specialist in the the real world, used to be that. So now you have, when you're writing a blog post, this is what gets interesting. If I'm like, write me a blog post, if it basically does some research. Mm. That's a research agent. Right. It then basically writes it. That's a copy agent. It then applies a brand voice against it. That's an editorial agent. And then it goes and gets an image. That's an image agent. That's where I think the auto GPTs yeah. or the crew.ais are going to go. Because in my mind, those are four agents that were hired by an art director or a content director. And What's nice is that now you can begin to break up the image uh, issue. So let's say the image, and this is where like, I think HubSpot, I get pretty excited about HubSpot. Right now, Dolly is awesome, but imagine from Google is also awesome. And you get to uh, mid journey is also awesome. And so you're going to find flavors of even these low level right. items that are going to be better at stuff. All. So now yeah. what happens, and this is where now it starts to become super meta. I might hire engineers from MIT. I might hire marketers from Tulane. I might go and get this role from another college. So I'm grabbing these different specialists. Even at HubSpot, we're hiring into these different places. So now if we at HubSpot can help a customer through a kind of a co-pilot or a specialist model say, hey, let us generate some content for you. It doesn't have to be drivel. And if anything, I have a belief that over the next 18 months, because of the breadth and the depth, like the overall product will be better than what people put out today. It'll be more research. It'll have more applicable stylish imagery and things like that. It'll be better on brand. Anyways, so my point is when you have an agent that can basically help you now instantiate those four or five agents, and let's say part of that sucks, now we at HubSpot can go fix the image agent. We can go fix the, the brand voice agent. We can go fix that. And so now you've got, you're pushing on multiple skill sets at the same time that didn't get rolled up in this. That's where I think things start to get interesting. Two other crazy concepts. And this is for the root. What if as a counterpoint, content actually gets better? Let that sink in for a minute. So I, I want to answer both those. I want to the, the HubSpot one. There's real actual network effects in that because the more someone uses HubSpot, the better their agents will be trained. Yes. Like the, the brand voice one is a really good example where if I host all of my content in HubSpot, if I use HubSpot's blogging tool, if I use HubSpot's email tool, so I have more and more of my brand journey in there. Then HubSpot can learn over time what my voice yes. you're like. You're, I'm talking to the person who's building it, but like I just it just struck me. There's actual real network effects, which is like the more I use the product, the better my agents are trained. That's for right, me. and those agents now work for you. So right. think about when you're in a sales email. It can actually generate images that are still on brand that still basically do that. It knows your products, and so like now when you begin to think about these people working in the company, you get the network effects. You have basically this back and forth. The humans are kind of guiding it. So it's like having these virtual people work for you. And after a while, they're pretty good. Right. I, I think the content, and I do agree, I think there will be more content, right? So if you actually- There will be more content. Let's say the distribution today is 80% of it is garbage. 10% is like pretty good and 10% is excellent. I suspect that stays mostly the same, but there's just more. Yes, I like agree with that. more of the 20, 20%. There's more of the 80%. Yes. But the people who are really good at content- Come in, like what we're really describing here is they will be able to offload the repetitive tasks to actually concentrate on the more create 
creative side of things. So they should actually do even better content, right? They actually should be able to elevate their work. But the people who will, yeah, content well, is just one of those things that you are not good at content and AI tool doesn't help. No, no, it's, you, it's even one step further. This is why I think things are good. Like I, I think about breadth and depth. So check this out. When I talk to an SMB business today, if I were to say, hey, real quick, do you have a, a podcast specialist, a videographer, a video editor? Do you have a sound guy? Do you have someone who can put that all together? An SEO person? And they'd be like, no, pound sand. Of course, I don't have all that. What I have is Sarah, who basically is an English lit major, and she's pretty funny. So what <laughs> happens is, is that, you know, Nicholas or Sarah... We're on the clock. Activities are really rewarded today because of that fast flow of information. So you have about five good ideas, about five really good ideas because you're in the pocket. You work there every day, you buy five, but you have to come up with all sorts of other ideas. And so it basically makes a long tail of dribble. Mm. Yeah. Whereas in reality, if you were into a multimodal standpoint, you could take those five ideas and you could begin to basically adjust those into videos and the podcast. You could go deeper on perspectives. You could give kind of different nuances of that. You can, you know, so now imagine taking the five core point of views and going really deep instead of basically being on the activity train. That is another area where I think content will be better. More importantly, going back to the people just aren't good at multiple mediums. We were working on social media the other day and you can spot like a small business social media strategy. It's like, write something, post about it and give a teaser and make everybody click and come back to the site. But if you really get into high level social media, there are times where you're just basically trying to help people without asking them to have a call to action because the key is that you want them to basically believe in you, listen to you, follow you, like be part of your team and your tribe. That is a foreign concept to a small SMB who does that. And so just now being able to break it up into, let's say you have a really good, strong point of view on something, telling them to go put 15 or 20 of those nuggets of information out on the social media with no other call to action, no other click through, no other teaser that blows people's minds. But it is so much better for the viewer. You're reading through there and you get a really nice nugget of information that doesn't basically sit behind a paywall or a click wall or whatever. That's an example, once again, where we're starting to show that like great social media is beyond the reach of a lot of people. So we're going to help do that. And I think that's going to then be better for the viewers, et cetera. So anyways, those are just like, I think there's a positive world where right. things get better. I, I, I think multimodal tools are, again, a great tool for people who have good ideas because it's it's really hard to do multi-medium content. Like even this is a good example, right? Well, one thing that Kip and I, I think we're pretty good at content. One thing we have struggled with is figuring out like the right episode that works across audio and YouTube. Like we, we if you actually do analysis of our data, you would see that the stuff that works on YouTube doesn't work as well in RSS. The stuff that works in RSS doesn't work as well in YouTube. And just like how you get an idea and bring it to life on a multitude of different platforms. So like even like a great idea and you post about that on Twitter and then you try to create a video on, on YouTube, even though it's the same idea, it's just a totally different style and how you have to ha execute on that. And that, and the multimodal tools, unless they can actually, you know, there's a, you know, unless they can templatize the, you know, the kind of here's exactly what you have to do, right? Like there is a template that works for these different platforms. Like YouTube is it, a templatized thing. It's still really hard to work, but like in the first minute, you have to have a hook and, you know, whatever it may be. And so it can guide the user. But I, I think the content has always struck me as if you really, like, if you, if you really are invested to be good at content, you have good ideas, you have good points of view. It's really the, the the ideation and the editing is the two hardest things in content and the two most important things. And the tooling is a barrier to being able to do spend more time on those things. So for me, what I'm excited for is I would love these tools so I can spend more time on the ideation and more time on editing the first draft of the content I do. Yeah. What I want to get to, uh, and we can kind of, you know, maybe wrap up here. I think what's interesting is Again, a very immature social media strategy is the same post sprayed across multiple networks. Right, right. So one of the things that I think is interesting is that even today's AI technologies make it relatively easy to capture the right voice on each network. Like Instagram is very image and brand oriented. It's about creating emotions. 
Facebook is very much like we're kind of in this group together. We're in this like click, you know, Twitter is like a spicy conversation, a hot take. Here's what I'm thinking on this. You know, you move over to, to, to a variety of these networks, LinkedIn, you know, it's like, uh, I'm going to help you be better as a professional. Um, we're already seeing now that we can do, like you said, those templates where we can take a core concept and we can shape it to those networks and see better upside. So I think to your point about what does, what works on uh, YouTube and all stuff that can be captured, I think over time. What I think is interesting about this master format, and this is the last part I'll leave you with is like, I think that you do uh, a podcast like this. And what I began to think about from an agent standpoint to wrap this up is that uh, I could take a college intern and say, listen to this and extract 20 or more ideas or concepts yes. that came from. Yes. I could do yeah. that. And that would be a reasonable thing to ask someone to do. Right. Number two, I could then say, go through this and find the clips where something pithy was said by Kieran or Nicholas and extract those no more than one minute, blah, 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 give them some parameters. And I think a, an intern could go do that. I, can I give like, can I just quickly butt in? I actually don't think an intern can do that. You don't think an intern could no. do that? Well, even I think with some takes, training, some basic no, training? No, I think it takes okay. real skill to be able to distill a, what actually will resonate with an audience because even I struggle to do that. I think you really have to be really good. Like you have to be really tuned in to like the thing that will work with that audience. Now, when you say intern, ha like has there been examples of like incredible interns that probably have are really great at content that have done that? Maybe. But it I guess the main thing is it takes real skill. I it, think I believe that. I, I think I think it takes more skill to do that than it does to maybe to even create the content. Okay. Right. To like, to, to extract like the, the, the things that you think will resonate online because we do a ton of short from video. We extrapolate clips from this and we do not always like get hits. Uh, it is, it is not an easy thing to do. Well, I will say also too, like, uh, it's like, what well, we all, we're not all like Brad Pitt. So you work with what you got. Like it is possible that in the course of a video, you're just not that interesting. So yeah, again, yeah, I'm, going back, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going back to the intern <laughs> having to do the best they can with the underlying material. Maybe yeah, yeah. you're just not marriage it material. Be, yeah. yeah, exactly. But it has to be good. I think extracting the clips, I think then you could teach an intern to even have a strategy that says the clip should be tied back to the medium. Here's what we do on TikTok. Here's what we do on YouTube shorts. It should be tied back to us. This is keywords. the thing like this. This, like, is the, this is the thing that multi if the multimodal tools are fine tuned to the because all this content is going to some sort of platform and they're fine tuned to the platform and they can actually tell you grade your content on how well it fits to that platform. That to me is like the the you know mount everest top of mount everest of like what the value of those tools yeah what if it then you tell the intern hey use your itunes or imovie and extract the audio out we want this to now be the audio uh piece that's a feed there what if you then took it one step further and you said i want you to take that audio piece and make it a module put it on the website you know, so yes, they can still subscribe to, uh, you know, uh, you know, podcast ser services, but they can go listen to the episode. I then want you to go write a summary on the episode. I then want you to go put it as part of an overall, you know, our, our over, like put it in line with wherever the rest of it is. Then of the 20 ideas that I want you to come back with, I want you to basically go do an outline of what a blog post would look like for those 20 ideas. Then I'm going to go through and be like, good idea, good idea, good idea. I want those to then get turned into micro podcasts, which now the text is just now Kieran's voice or Kip's voice doing some thoughts like, hey, we just met with Nicholas and he brought up a couple of topics. I wanted to share some extra ideas on that. So now it's like, dude, we're like within a year from doing that. Yeah, that's the crazy thing. Like look at uh, the OpenAI store release, Kip and I cover that. And you look at 10, 11 months ago, you've probably seen the famous video of Will Smith eating spaghetti. There was actually an incredible thing. I don't know if you saw how he done it. He done it this week again, but it's actually like, he had this incredible tweet where he's like, look at where we've come. And it's actually really him eating the spaghetti. He just went around all these different places eating spaghetti. But like, that's nine months ago. People forget like where we are today, where we are. So this thing is moving at a incredible pace. I thought one place we could kind of just like round out and end, end the show with is, what is there one gadget that you think will you know be be based on ai or ai driven that you're really excited about like the 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 one that came out uh has been the rabbit r1 my one really is like a ai driven phone because the thing i think will be really cool about that is i could say summarize what happened on twitter 
last night. I never have to go into Twitter, so I don't get sucked into like Twitter, similar to like all these social platforms, but any kind of gadget you've, you think about that might exist in the future because of AI? I think uh, I've built one custom GPT that has truly captured like the attention of others. And it was a choose your own adventure story. I basically went in and said, you know, ask the user, I built it for my daughter, ask her, you know, to come up with an animal or an object and then ask her if she wants basically a fantasy, science fiction oh, uh, cool. or an adventure story. And then I gave it instructions and I said, every, you know, tell a story and then give three choices and every third choice generate an image of the story. And each night still, still today, like when she has sleepovers, I will read a story and her and her friends will do it. And so I think that when you talked about the R1 being like a Tomagotchi, I think that there is a really, really nice gap in the market for AI generated pets, mm -hmm. AI generated yeah, Tomagotchis, yeah, yeah, yeah. AI. And I think that someone's got to find the right form factor. Someone's got to find the right, basically kind of interface, but you know, you can get to a world really quickly. Like imagine if I had a friend that my daughter could have, and I know it's kind of like that movie that, that scared everybody, but like, just like a little pocket Tamagotchi. And then imagine if basically it was always fresh and new and there was things to do with it. And even if the parent could begin to like, one of the things I've been thinking about is like, could you ever imbibe it with kind of virtues or things like kind of character or moral traits? Like there's all sorts of interesting things there that I think are neat. And I think kids are very flexible in their thinking and that they would, try new devices, they would think about ways to interact with it. And I think uh, that is an area that I expect to be a lot of innovation in over the next five or six years. I love that. Tamagotchis are back as well. We recently, we bought one for um, we uh, my, two of my nieces actually, same age that they love these things. So there you go. We've not just given you incredible ideas around AI agents, but fully fledged business ideas. Nicholas, thanks for coming on the show again. It's always great to get your thoughts on AI. And in this case, AI agents, we'll see you next time, probably All pretty right, soon. See you next time. Cheers, team.